Hello, everybody. Today we are talking about archival art supplies. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. Let's get started by talking about the different contexts in which archival materials actually matter and the contexts when it really does not matter at all. And tell us in the chat, what's your experience or lack of experience with archival materials? Because I know it is a very confusing subject and there's a lot of information out there that makes it hard to discern what to listen to. So Lauren, we have placed on the slide art that you will sell. Why is that important to have work that's not gonna disintegrate in 10 years? Well, you, you want your, your client or customer who is, or collector who is buying this artwork to be pleased with the quality. Usually when you're running a business, even if it's just yourself, you want to offer a high quality thing. You don't want them to come back in a few years and say, hey, this thing I paid several hundred dollars or a thousand dollars for or whatever, it's it's faded or it's coming off of its canvas. I want a refund. You want to give them a nice thing. I mean, Clara, do you think about that when you're selling your work? I didn't when I was 22. <laughs> I have an example because the school I taught at was having an auction. And so I thought, okay, I'll donate some pieces. I was just art art school. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. And so I had all these figure drawings that were on newsprint. And so I had two of them matted. And actually what ended up happening because the newsprint was so fragile and it wasn't under glass, it actually got a little tear on it after the person bought it. Like they hadn't even taken it home. And how dumb was I to number one, present it like that, but number two, newsprint, that's like the worst paper alive. Yeah, newsprint will yellow within a, a few months, really. Yeah, it, really it goes fast. bad so quickly. Of course, if your art is going into a museum collection, I'm in one museum collection. <laughs> That's one more than me, Clara. At this point in time, no museum collections. Yeah, but I feel like a fraud because I didn't get asked by the curator. It was a dealer who owned one of my prints and he donated it to this okay. museum at Dartmouth. So I don't really feel like that counts. <laughs> at least when it's in a museum, there's generally somebody there who works with con... con conservation con yeah. conservator conservation yes so they can at least help extend the life of whatever it is you've made also archivability does include digital artists we're not going to get into that today that's a whole other stream but lauren can you give people just the lowdown on that yes so even digital things, the more you share them or send them or copy them, the more they degrade over time. You, The most common area where this comes up, I think, is with music and ripping music, sending it to other people, MP3s, all that. So you just want to make sure that you are saving and creating high quality, high data versions of your artwork. Jen says, I see why people care about archivalness, but the cynic in me also doesn't know if it really matters. Will anyone care about our art after we're gone? Will the earth even still exist? Who knows? You said the exact same thing to me, Lauren. I did, I did. <laughs> you can totally take it that way. And a lot of people do. I think that the art, the art world is really half and half on the idea of archive archivability. So that's totally valid. Speaking of when it's not necessary, there's many times when I just don't care. I just grab what's around. For example, newsprint. I go to a figure drawing group. I do 30 gesture drawings on newsprint. I know going into that context that I'm not going to save anything because that whole experience is about just getting drawing practice. Now, Lauren, what about artwork where the final result is not the physical painting? 
if you're doing something that involves it going somewhere else, as long as it looks good at that point in time and you can capture a good image of it that is reproducible, that is printable, you don't have to worry so much about that physical object that you made because it doesn't, that's not the final product. That's not where the value is in it. I actually had a illustration I was doing and I used fluorescent paint and the fluorescent paint dries a totally different color. Yeah. And so I actually took a picture of it before it dried and that was the illustration. And so that's one of the liberating things when you're making something, it's going to go in a magazine or it's going to be published somewhere in a book. It actually does not matter at all what happens to the physical artwork later. And by the way, Lisa says archival is relative. Even high quality paper won't last forever. There's also taking care of the work. I mean, some things really do need to be under glass. And Lauren, I think it's just really confusing to know all these things. Like, well, how do we figure this out? I think I treat archivability for artwork a lot like I think about people. Everybody is going to die. You're not going to stop that. But there are ways that you can stay healthier so you don't die as soon. Or another thing is some of us get really good genes and some of us inherit some bad crap. So that's going to affect your health and how long your life is. Similarly with art materials, if you are using materials that don't work so well, I mean, that's going to affect the age that your artwork will get to, but that's, that's fine. That's how, that's how it is. There's nothing inherently wrong, I guess, with making something that's not archivable. You just have to understand that's what you're doing. Here's one thing that is very confusing for a lot of people is that let's say you have an artwork and you use different media together. All the materials in the artwork have to be archival for the artwork to be archival. So for example, Lauren, I've had people say, well, I have this archival varnish. And if I put that over newsprint, does that then make the newsprint archival? What's the answer? Nope, because the newsprint has, has stuff going on in it that's gonna make it disintegrate anyways. I think with newsprint in particular, it's an issue with pH. The pH for something archival has to be neutral, I believe. And so a lot of paper tends to be acidic. My dad's a paper maker. I feel like I should know this, but I always get these things confused. But anyways, that pH can then affect the other things that are touching that piece of paper or say the varnish or the glue or the stretcher bars. Any of that is going to affect whatever else it touches in the artwork. Katerina says, I've heard about conservators cursing out 20th century painters for mixing oil and tempera and acrylic, thus making it impossible to find a proper solvent. We are going to get to oil and acrylic in a little bit, but oh my gosh, those conservatives, they have such a difficult job. I mean, there was an artist, somebody told me that all her work is on post-it notes. What are you supposed to do with that? Uh, yeah, those those fade so quickly. Oh, man. And seeing some of those big Abex paintings, once you know that they were not thinking about archivability, you look out for all of the signs of aging on it and you see, I don't know, is it, am, I, am I thinking of Helen Frankenthal? Or there, I'm thinking of some painter, uh, woman painter that use so much stand oil that the painting what? is like all squiggly and like yellow and weird when you look at it up close it's it's had a lot of retouching in the photos or the photos came from way earlier the thing is like aged to ancientness in only what 60 70 years and by the way for those of you who are wondering to be a conservator you actually have to do a degree conservation science so it's not something that you can just learn on the job. And I find it fascinating. I've never had the opportunity to go behind the scenes, but maybe I need to make some friends. <laughs> okay, let's explain what pH is because this affects 
different supplies. So it's it's not just one category. It's glue, it's paper. So what is pH, Lauren? pH is the acidity or baseness of an object or, or substance. You've probably learned about pH in your chemistry class when you were in middle school, I think. I got a C. <laughs> I know. The only I, C I ever got was in chemistry. I think I got a, a I got a B plus in chemistry. That was my first uh, B was in chemistry. I did not. I comparatively did not do well either. But so pH, I think your first run in with pH is going to be with paper because every paper has a pH. That's the surface you're working on. And someone in the chat here I saw was talking about the pH, but there's trees produce a thing or and paper produces a thing that makes it acidic and that acid can eat away at the paper. Yeah, so Carolyn says, heard that more and more papers acid free these days, something about changes in the paper making process, but I could be wrong. The most important thing is to check and we'll go over it a little bit how to do that. But I think for paper, it's a big difference in price because newsprint is super cheap. Reeves BFK, really nice watercolor paper is not cheap. So this is a circumstance in terms of archivability with paper you do get what you pay for. Now that's not always the case with other materials, but oh, Lauren, good quality paper. It's so good. Oh, it's it's wonderful. And Seven Angelic <laughs> is saying cotton is considered the most archival material for paper materials. So finding that cotton rag, you hear that word cotton rag used the same from paper printmakers, the same way you hear like linen from uh, from painters. So look, that can be one thing that you look for. Then you don't even really need the acid free. It, they're gonna say it's acid free anyways, but when it says cotton rag, you know it's acid free. Maria says archivability is a whole subject of study and to reach it, it's expensive. Feels like archival is a sign of I charge more than you can afford. I think there's obviously every art supply industry is a different thing, but I can confirm that good paper just takes so much more involved. And while there are certain art supplies that I won't pay for, paper is one that I do because paper to me is such a game changer. It can completely change the way you interact with a specific medium. Before I found really nice watercolor paper, I didn't like watercolor that much. And I know Lauren, you've been doing some cyanotypes so I'm suspecting you're using some archival paper there. Well, I'm doing it on canvas. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you, I think that you do bring up a good point here, Maria, in that it's even though we just said that for a piece to be archival, all of it has to be archival. I think in that case, we were referring to the the substrates that you are working on. It's, it's really hard to be entirely perfectly archival without spending so much money. And artists just yeah. need to make art and need to function. So there are some things that you can do to get the most bang for your buck, I'm going to say. So in this case, when we're talking about at least getting acid-free paper, that's one of them. It, it costs more, but it costs less than, say, I don't know, buying aluminum stretchers. That's an archival thing for painters. So pick and choose what you want here. Same thing with glue. You could get Elmer's school glue. I actually don't know if it's archival or not, but in book binding, in printmaking, oh, there's all these yummy glues. I love these glues. Like they just like glide on and then you press on your paper. It's just the most oh beautiful experience. All of these glues. That said though, they cost more. And so that's, again, where you have to ask yourself, do I really need it to be archival? Because there's a lot of people for whom it just does not matter. And of course, depending on your budget, maybe you're not able to as well. But I know things like bookbinding, that whole field, I think is a lot more about archival materials. Whereas Lauren, I feel like with painting, there's so much that people do. It's so hard to categorize. I think since the Abex painters and since as 
we mentioned in the chat there, the mid-century painters, they kind of exploded painting, so it can just be anything now and you can still charge a lot of money. But yes, I think like atelier painting really focuses on, on that, on archivability. So Slimy is confirming Elmer's is archival. Good to know. Anna is asking, how do you balance desire for archivability with sustainability? It seems like contradictory goals. Whew. Yeah, that's a hard one. There are artists that make sustainability their whole mission. I see that a lot with printmakers actually using inks that are natural, non-toxic, and those, some of them last a while, but a lot of them fade over time. I think in terms of painting, we're object makers involved in a very capitalist object making field. So that becomes kind of hard. I think that it's not very sustainable. Uh, yeah. So it, you got to think of maybe you're balancing it out with reducing your carbon footprint in other areas. I think you have to end up looking at other areas of your life to reduce your overall harm to the world. Pat says the printmaking ink I use is oil-based, but can be washed with soap and water. It says it gives quote archival results, which sounds a bit suspicious. I've never heard that before. The whole thing about printmaking is the most important thing is the paper, because once you get that good quality cotton rag paper, most inks are okay. I mean, I don't know that they make printmaking ink to not be archival. That seems really weird because I sort of associate that as being an inherent quality with professional printmaking supplies. Again, I could be wrong though, but I've never heard that <laughs> phrase before. So I guess I can see why you're a little suspicious. <laughs> I've used some of those oil-based, uh, like, washable inks, and I also, I, I am suspicious of them. I don't know how to use, they, they, they feel weird, like a weird in-between. I think I need to do more research. If anybody in the chat does have more information on those, though, please let us know. By the way, everybody, before we move on, we do have March and April workshops. Registration is open right now. It is due this Friday. Get your forms in because if you don't get them in and we don't have enough enrollment, you won't be able to register later. <laughs> so do it now. Don't wait until later because it might not be available. How do I know if a supply is archival or not? This is just, oh so confusing and there's so much incorrect information out there. It's so difficult. What do you do, Lauren, when you don't know? There are some brands that, since, since I am not the archival master, I, I just go to the brands that know more than me. There are some brands that are really known for their quality and care for archivalness. One brand that I really love is an acrylic painter is Golden. They are literally scientists of acrylic paint. And they, on their website, they have whole notes about how and when to use a specific material to keep it archival and what not to mix with what. And you can even call the number on the back of the paint and get someone on the line that will tell you whether it's archival or not, which is pretty cool. Uh, but <laughs> that that's that's my go to is is to, is to go to the the brand. But Clara, maybe you have a different thing that you do. I do a lot of Googling and sometimes that just makes me more confused. So the company website is a very good one because if the manufacturer tells you that stuff, and they're really supposed to. I, I mean, I always feel like Copix is kind of a scam because they just never mention that they're not light fast. And most people don't know about it, even though the whole world is gushing over Copix. I mean, I, I wonder if it's even on their website. I, I, I think I have a theory about that, actually, Clara, because yeah. nobody had ever talked about it to me. And I was so depressed. But also most people that I know aren't using Copics in that way where they make the thing and then that object is the actual object. When I see people using Copics, Copics, they're usually then scanning or taking a picture and then the main product is the digital thing. 
So I think, and in that case, it's like what we said before, it doesn't matter if it's archival and they're probably keeping it in a sketchbook or in a flat file. They're not putting it under glass in a gallery or somewhere. So in a way that's, that, that was my fault. I didn't understand the context of the material I was using. Alexandria says, is there a dependable base list of archival materials for a fundamental group of mediums? Are you talking about paint mediums, Alexandra? Maybe you can go in and explain a little bit more and we can come back to your question. Another good note from 7A, archival slash safe storage for art at home is yeah. something to think about too. Humidity can kill. And there are certain pieces, you just don't want to put them in an area that has bright, sunshine every right. single day. If you go to the Metropolitan, they do have this wonderful gallery that's just Degas soft pastels. And if you go into that gallery, the light is very dim. And it's so that way they can preserve those drawings, which are incredibly fragile at this point. So where you keep your artwork matters. Like Lauren, we just posted that one about how you store your paintings. And yes. I didn't know the thing you said about the floor. Tell them now. Oh, the floor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So in general, it is very helpful if you can keep your artwork off the ground, just a little bit off the ground, either with shims, like little pieces of wood underneath it, anything propped up or on discarded old pallets or just anything, because if there's ever a leak in your area, that water is going to go towards the floor first and then you're going to get mold on your paintings or mold on your canvas or whatever. So that will save you a lot of stress. I am really stressing this right now because this happened to me recently in my very wonderful, lovely studio that I love so much. We've had an issue with leaks and I have had to learn the hard way that you really have to keep stuff shimmed no matter how safe you think it is. Another thing is there's actually companies who only do archival materials. So that's Linico, and they specialize in bookbinding materials. This is where you get all that delicious PVA glue and bone folders and all that fun stuff. But everything that they have is archival, and that's the basis of this company. So they also sell things like museum boxes and those plastic sleeves that are archival. So this is a really good company to go to because you know that that's what their specialty is. Let's talk about light fastness. <laughs> this is always <laughs> such a big topic of discussion because there's 80 billion markers out oh, there yeah. and it gets really confusing because, okay, Windsor and Newton is light fast for their pigment markers. Copic is oh. not light fast. But then I say, oh, Windsor Newton, why do you have like three colors? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why I hate about the acrylic markers is that they seem to have fewer colors available. So the reason why Copics aren't light fast is they are alcohol based markers. And I wish I knew the chemistry and all that. Autumn Rain has a great example or explanation here about it having to do with the pigment used plus the pigment load. So I'm wondering if the alcohol mixed with the pigment is what makes them not light fast, but they fade so quickly. They fade more like quicker than any other medium I have ever used. And I wish I had some before and after pictures to show you. So that was my pivot to acrylic markers, which I'm guessing have that higher pigment load. I mean, they feel very heavy. They got, they got a lot, they're literally paint, like high flow paint. And that has given me more staying power. Although I have seen a comment here from, oh man, I think. I'll click on it. Okay. Uh, I think it was from Jazz that says acrylic markers can suck sometimes too. So, oh, I found it. I found it. Ah, okay. sorry. That was me. Okay. Acrylic markers can suck sometimes too. So I think, again, it's thinking about what is the pigment that is being used in the acrylic marker because it the pigment can still not be light fast. Well, thank goodness we have Autumn Rain here to explain <laughs> that Copic markers are made with dye, not pigment. That's the difference. And you, of Autumn course, Rain. you have to research this because every single brand has a different 
thing that they say, and there's 50 billion markers out there. So this is where it gets very, very confusing. Paul is asking about Sharpies. I believe those are alcohol based because I know you can erase them. With they alcohol, also have the so. smell, the alcohol sure. smell. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Sharpies do fade over time too, except for the oil based Sharpies. <laughs> what? I didn't know they're oil based Sharpies. Yes. That's why you use like silk screening. Oh, okay. Yeah. Check that out. Another we can talk about this. <laughs> D says, if I use the markers on archival paper as a part of a multimedia piece, but under spray fixative and wax, should that help? It goes back to what we said at the very beginning of the stream, which is that you have to have everything be archival. So adding the spray or the fixative or a varnish is not going to make it archival. The, the, in that case, it's the marker that's still going to end up fading over time. Sonnet says, so does every medium have some sort of archival option? That's a question for you. I think that there are some mediums that are inherently less archival than others. But I think that there are a lot of archival options for each medium. So I guess say for sculpture, um, you know, there are ceramics, that, there are different types of ceramics that last longer than others. For painting, oil is a very safe bet a lot of the time, provided you're using linen and, you know, yes, there is an archival option usually. I guess I would want to hear a specific medium and that you have a question about, and then we can come up with the archival option. It's, it's hard for me to pick right out of my brain. <laughs> Jenna's asking, what even is the difference between dye and pigment? I think I do know this one, actually. Okay, you answer. <laughs> uh, all the textiles people are going to kill me. So I think <laughs> that a dye is a solution. It's, it's, a, it's a liquid. And then, uh, or it, it uh, attaches to things in a liquid form versus the pigment is a solid. It comes from a, a so you can get pigment powder and then you mix it with a binder and that's what makes the color. And dyes tend to be a little bit more finicky than pigments because dyes require certain setting of the surface that you're working on and then setting of the dye in order for it to uh, register and stay on that thing for a long time without Fading. Okay. Uh, Autumn Rain, can you check me on that? Sounds like you know about this. <laughs> Let's talk about oil and acrylic because I know this also gets confusing because you don't just have the paint, but you also have things like, for example, oil primer versus acrylic gesso. So let's give you the lowdown on acrylic and oil. Essentially, you can put oil over acrylic. That's totally fine. Oil can always go on acrylic, but you cannot put acrylic and mix it in with your oil paint because oil paint, I always think about oil paint as like these little monsters that eat things all the time. And so if you give them a nice little snack, which is acrylic ink <laughs> or acrylic paint, they'll just eat it up. And so you never want to mix them together. In fact, I keep my brushes separate. So I have yeah. acrylic brushes and I have oil brushes. So that way I'm not getting stuff in between. You, you don't use oil though. You only use acrylic. I actually use both now, especially with the cyanotypes. I use oil on top after, but here, here's the, uh, here's the archival thing. I, I gesso the cyanotype after I've done it so that I can put my oils on top without the oils affecting the surface and the cyanotype. <laughs> I also, I don't even know if that's like going to work because this is a totally new process for me, painting on top of cyanotype. So we'll we'll see. But I'm just doing what I know as far as our capability goes. But I do have, I do want to give an example here, Clara, of what happens when you put acrylic on top of oil, which you're not supposed to do, or put acrylic mixed up with oil, 
uh, I, I did do a painting that had some of that. And what ended on up purpose? happening? Huh? On purpose? I mean, I was I was at RISD. I needed to get an assignment done and I really needed to use a certain color that I only had in acrylic on top of an okay. oil painting. So I wasn't thinking about archivability. That painting my partner's parents really love, end up putting on their wall. It's now what, 10 years? Mm, when I make that? Oh my God. It's almost 14 years old now, I think. Uh, nice kid. <laughs> right. It's 13 years old. And the areas where the acrylic is on top of the oil, that acrylic is flaking off the painting. It's just coming oh, no right kidding. off. Nobody has touched it. It has not moved in the past 10 years. It's been up there in that spot that long. It's flaking off of the painting. I can see it with the little skin flakes on the floor. It's gross. So that's what happens if you wanted to know. I know a lot of people will do, for example, an acrylic underpainting and then paint yes. oil over That's it. That I is did. totally fine. Yeah. And sometimes it's a lot faster than doing an acrylic underpainting. But the thing about oil too is there's that rule fat over lean, which basically says you incrementally build up the layers. So for example, you wouldn't want to start with like a big chunk of oil paint because that's going to dry all weird and take forever and ever. I mean, oil painting to fully dry takes a year. And if it's something that's big and crusty, it's going to be even longer than that. So a lot of the issue with oil is just the dry time, the real dry time. I don't mean dry to the touch. I mean, yeah. really, truly dry is really, really long. Yeah. I have that egg painting, Clara. I think I've posted this on yeah. our art prof page too. That that this egg painting, I was just like, oh, I'm gonna make an egg out of oil paints and just dump stand oil all over it to oh. make like an egg. And the yellow oh. is pure cadmium yellow medium, just straight from the tube. And oh. it is still <laughs> not dry. That painting looks so gross. The yellow is still. <laughs> <laughs> I did that painting in 2015, so it's nine years old and it's still not there. <laughs> oh my gosh. What were you thinking? Why did you put so much stand oil in that? Again, again, it, it was for an assignment. It was I was just thinking about the assignment, not about how old it was gonna get. <laughs> Guess what, everybody? We have the painting. <laughs> oh, that's when it was new. That's when it looked great. It's so aged, it looks so gross. It looks like those eggs have been in the trash for nine years Ugh, that, that's really new and sonnet is asking archival option for pastels to my knowledge pastels are just pastels i mean unless you get like the super super cheap one i probably would be suspicious but the whole thing about pastels is they have to be on acid-free paper and also again not in like direct sunlight is probably a bad way to do that. I mean, unfortunately, with things like oil pastels and soft pastels, the only truly safe way to store them is under glass, which we all know is really not practical for a lot of people. Maria wants to know how to ensure that collage is archival. You've done quite a bit of collage. Yeah, so in that case, it depends what you're collaging. I'm thinking, I've done collage, but who I think about is my grandfather who did a ton of collage with everyday materials. So he used the right glues and things, which are really awesome. But when you're doing collage, you're getting, you're sourcing papers from everywhere. And a lot of times those papers and the inks that are printed on the papers are not archival. So one of the things that re we're running into in some of his work is that since it's been under sunlight for a long period of time, the printed inks are are fading but i would i if if you're doing collage i think one way to at least keep everything on the same page and keep that back safe and not have that sort of fall apart is to use that pva glue that we were talking about that's at least what i use or yes and paste. <clears throat> we have a comment from cc who says it seems like every odd material is a thing of art in modern and contemporary times, cardboard, major sculpture, painting with fruit and resins. And yet some of this makes it into museums, what's up? It's really difficult for the conservation teams. I went to the Sarah Z show, which was at the Guggenheim Museum, I think a couple months ago, and she has plants 
inside her installations. And I went to a lecture she did many years ago. Somebody asked her about that. And she said that when her work enters a museum collection, there are extremely detailed <laughs> instructions for how to install it, how to replace the bulb or whatever it is. So I think I would guess it's somewhat in the responsibility of the artist to be kind <laughs> to the conservation team and provide options because yes, that's very stressful. We can also, this reminds me, Clara, of the banana duct tape, our favorite piece. Our favorite our artwork. Favorite piece. And so in that case, that banana is not going to last forever or even a week. Man, they should throw it out after a couple of days. I hate that banana smell. What yeah. the what the person bought when they bought that piece was basically a title and the instructions for making the piece then signed by the artist. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. So in a lot of those cases where it's something that's more conceptual or even requires a lot of care, like Sarah C's work, they're, you're, you're buying mostly the, the, the concept and the care behind it as well as the piece. We have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you creates artwork in response to some of our materials. So this is the Drawing Basics track. And the track is a series of video lessons and prompts that you can do at your own pace. So this is Anna Bastos. I apologize if I didn't say your name correctly. And Anna started this when she started university and slowly stopped drawing because she was in university, didn't draw at all for six months. And so the biggest challenge was getting used to drawing again. So that way she could continue with the track, hard comparing myself when I started from when I was getting back, I was unhappy. It took time to regain my confidence. And now because Anna has finished the track, she says, I realize how much it taught me to enjoy the process. Take my time sketching ideas, thus gaining more confidence. Yeah, I mean, Lauren, the tracks are so involved you cannot finish the track and not improve. I Yes, totally. Because you're doing so many assignments and they require so many steps and you really get super lost in that process in a good way. And you can see all of these results here. Look at these ducks. They're so cute. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> It's just the tracks are giving you multiple opportunities to really work your muscles. And Anna, you've got some beautiful techniques in here. I see you using so many different things. I see that there's hatching. I see you're doing all these different colors. These are spectacular thumbnails. Oh, they're so you've good. got <laughs> so much diversity in them and you're thinking about composition and great research. Here we have the tree. We also have the rock. And I love the little color palette at oh. the bottom. That's just so much fun. And at the top as well. And so here is Anna's final drawing. Oh, Anna is here and live in the chat. Welcome. We're so proud of you, Anna. This is a real accomplishment. Lauren. It's so cool. You've done, I love seeing all this work here. And also I know that we try to get beyond beautiful sketches and, you know, using a sketchbook for work, but I just also love seeing how beautiful and organized these all are. It's really hitting a, hitting the Capricorn in me that loves seeing planning. You did such a great job. We're so proud. When you guys do stuff like this, I get a little, I get a little uh, lump in my throat. <laughs> I'm so proud of you guys. So great job, oh, Anna. Remember, workshop registration is due this Friday. Don't delay because if it doesn't run, it's your fault that you can't register later. So you better register on Friday to make sure that we can keep registration open. So register on artprof.org. All the information is on the front page. By the way, sorry, the slide is incorrect. I can't do the chat tonight because I have five paintings due tomorrow at midnight. And I think I'm gonna die if I don't get started right after the stream. And Lauren, maybe you wanna show them what's oh, wrong with you. So your I got, 
I got hand surgery um, last week. I finally got it, but it means that my typing is pretty slow and not great. I'm using my non-dominant hand here. Uh, so I'm also not going to be in the chat tonight. I'm really sorry, guys, but... Yeah, I'm sorry, everybody. We will next time. I just yeah. think I'm going to die. Like, this is totally my fault. I'm paying for it so bad right now. Uh, but good luck. Are... It's so cool. <laughs> No, it's not. If I have to stay up all night, I'm like, I don't need to relive my art school days. <laughs> <laughs> Join our Open Studios Club. This is a new program where we get together as a group and we make art together in real time. I am getting work done in these Open Studios Club sessions. It's a great place to make art friends. Join our Patreon group. You can share your art in weekly voice sessions with staff. I write very, very long critiques, and it's a great place to make art friends. Thank you so much to our amazing top Patreon supporters who do so much for us here to keep us up and running. Visit artprof.org for content that's not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Artprof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. Oh, I forgot to put my Gumby picture. Shoot. <laughs> I, I took the cutest Gumby picture and I didn't put it into the slide. Shoot. You're going to have to watch next time. Oh, that means it will just be next time. It's the cliffhanger for next, well, next yes. stream. The, gum, the Gumby picture. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you Thanks. next time. Bye. Bye.